the uh, with the panelists. So let me first introduce the four panelists to you. So we uh, have Cardena Bowen. Uh, he's the founder and director of Stanford's Brain and Silicon Lab. The lab develops silicon integrated circuits that emulate the way neurons compute and computational models that link neurobiophysics to cognitive behavior. This bridges neuro neurobiology and medicine with electronics and computer science. So furthermore, we'll have uh, Bill Daly. He's the chief scientist of NVIDIA and a professor at Stanford University. With his Stanford team, Bill developed much of the technology that is found in most large parallel computers today and previously made significant advances at MIT and Caltech. So we will have also Ralph Etienne Cummings, who directs the Computational Sensor and Motor System Laboratory at John Hopkins University. His research spans a range of electrical and computer engineering topics, including but not limited to mixed signal, BISL systems, computational sensors, computer vision, neuromorphic engineering, smart structures, mobile robotics, and neuroprothetic devices. And finally, we'll have Jan Lecan, who is the chief uh, AI scientist at Meta and professor at New York University. An ACM Turing Award uh, laureate for his uh, research on deep learning. Jan also researches computer vision robotics and computational neuroscience. So we will have um, all presentations will be 10 minutes and we will have uh, no discussion after each talk so we will have a joint discussion after the four presentations and uh, i will first give the words to the panelists themselves to fight against each other and then uh, the discussion will be op open to the audience in the chat so please feel free already to put your questions into the chat during the whole uh, presentations uh, and we will finally after the discussion of the panelists um, ask these questions um, which have been raised in the chat. So uh, yeah, I would like now to give the words to uh, uh, to Kwabena. Please share your uh, presentation. Oh, yeah, good. You can hear me now. Should I start? Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to argue that silicon brains are the future of artificial intelligence. And um, my, uh, I'll start by describing state of the art uh, deep neural networks. This example is from OpenAI GPT 3, is the third in a series of large language models that they've developed starting in 2018 with GPT-1, which had 117 million parameters, to GPT-2 with 1.5 billion in 2019, and GPT-3 in 2020 with 175 billion parameters. So we've seen the height of these stacks of decoders increase from eight, eightfold to 96 decoders, and the width increased from 16, 16x to 12,000 dimensions these are signals that are flowing across these from decoders to one decoder to the next and parameters increase 1500 to 175 billion weights and the reason why you're seeing this aggressive scaling here is that the errors that are made in predicting the next word follow a power law so from gpt2 to gpt3 weights increase 117 fold the amount of data used to train increase five fold and that total of 570 fold more flops reduce the error by 1.4 fold okay here we are measuring compute in petaflops which is 10 to the 15 floating point operations per second running for a whole day that's one unit of compute here and this asymptote here where these different size models basically minimize the error or cross entropy loss follows a minus 120 exponent 
And just to sort of put that in perspective, to you know, if you increase flops by two to the twenty, you reduce error by a factor of two, and two to the twenty is a million-fold increase in compute. And so, because of this unfavorable scaling, um, but you know, it is what it is. Um, it's cost about five million dollars to train GPT-3 because you had ten thousand GPUs running all out for two weeks. And so what we've seen is over you know the last couple of decades gone from doubling the amount of compute training to train these deep neural networks every 24 months to doubling every 3.4 months and with these large language models that compute is doubling every two months and so now basically training gpt3 releases as much carbon as 1500 cars do in two weeks and we've also seen google's data centers use uh, the energy they are using increase almost fourfold in seven years. And so this kind of resource intensive approach to artificial intelligence is not gonna deliver AI for all. It's distributed very unequitably. And my dream of having, you know, being able to talk to my phone, like I will talk to a librarian in the library to find out what I'm looking for, is far from being realized right now. If we could actually do this, run these, large uh, systems on our own personal devices. It would offload data processing from the cloud, reducing its carbon footprint. It would allow us to personalize the interaction, customize it to the user, allow, re allow real time, word by word speed translation, for example. And it would be secure. The data acquired and kept on our phones is not vulnerable to uh, attacks. But if you run the numbers, it's going to require like a 15-fold faster preprocessor with a 170-fold bigger battery to run GPT-3 on your phone. Now, what could what approach? What I'm going to argue is that matching the brain's energy scaling would deliver AI for all. It would give us the sleep and energy efficiency to allow us to distribute AI equitably, and so and reduce its carbon footprint. And just to summarize the argument here, I'll fill in details later, but just at a high level, if you look at the way we are building chips right now in 2D and the way we are signaling across these chips with these binary signals, about half of the wires are signaling at any given time. So that's a dense uh, activity. The energy per, per unit time or power consumption versus the number of units or neurons that we have in these brain-like models is going to increase quadratically, you know, and if we go to a 3D chip and we are still using these dense binary signals, that is dropping that to the three halves power scaling. And if we go to 3D and we can make these signals very sparse by using a different number uh, coding, we would be at linear scaling of energy per number of neurons. And this matches the mammalian brain which you see here going from 100 million neurons to 100 billion, which is us. Another way of looking at this scaling, the impact of this, these uh, exponents, is if we actually say, okay, we have a human brain, which is using this sort of 3D very sparse signaling, built in 3D using very sparse signaling with 86 billion neurons, and we said, okay, with that amount of power consumption, if we were just scaling at the three halves power, how big a brain could we build with the same amount of power consumption? And we are going to be down to 2 billion which is the capybara's brain. And if we were scaling quadratically, it would be actually at the fly brain with you know, 300,000 neurons. And so these exponents make a huge difference. It's a difference between running something on your phone versus in the data center. Now, if we now look at how I got these exponents, just I'm gonna spend a few minutes explaining that, you basically, I just start from first principles, right? We all know that work equals force times distance. Uh, an electrical signal also does work proportional to the distance, right? So it's analogous to filling a hose with water, like you see here. Uh, the water corresponds to charge, uh, the volume corresponds to capacitance, and the work that's done is charge times voltage, which, because the capacitance is increasing with distance, the charge is also increasing with distance, okay? And voltage is just energy per unit charge. And so just by applying these principles here and coming out with the layout of these 2D or 3D chips, and calculating how long every, all these wires are and how many signals they are, you can start to, to figure out how the energy is gonna scale as you increase the number of neurons that you have. And one way to actually reduce the exponent is to go from 2D chips we're building now to 3D uh, skyscrapers, okay? 
that's going to shorten the distances just like how commutes are shorter in Manhattan. And the memory industry actually started doing this back in 2007. And you, if you go one of the latest iPhones or Galaxy phones, you've got like one terabyte of memory on your phone and it's made out of eight of these memory chips. And each one of them has a stack of memory cells that's 128 layers tall, okay? And, um, and but you know, with computing, we are still here in 2D. And so if we could leverage these advances to compute in 3D, then we could get a more favorable scaling. And what, but then there's a, there's a problem, right? Um, but let's, let's compare 2D versus 3D first before we get to that, that, that problem. And so if I have a network with 10 layers, with 10 units in each layer, well, the connectivity, the wave matrix from one layer to the next, I could lay that out in what's called a crossbar here. And the longest wire will be about 10 units long, okay? It's proportional to the number of units in a layer. And to get a signal across all 10 crossbars, I need a wire that's about 100 units long. And notice that this is proportional to the number of neurons, total number of neurons in my network. So I have, you know, neurons that are doing work that's proportional to the total number, and I have signals that are proportional to the total number of neurons. So that's why I get the quadratic scaling in 2D if half the neurons are sending signals. Now, I can shorten these very long wires down to like 10 if I stack these crossbars instead of tiling them. And notice that 10 is the square root of the number of, of, of neurons. So now I've reduced my scaling from quadratic to three halves, okay? And now, the, the, but there's an issue here, okay? By basically, I'm taking this area here, which is, you know, 100 by 100, and I've reduced it to a surface area here, which is 10 by 10. So that's a hundredfold reduction in surface area to dissipate heat, but the heat that I'm generating by sending these signals around has only reduced a factor of 10. So I have a thermal problem. This 3D chip is gonna overheat. The way to deal with that is again, look at Los Angeles versus Manhattan. You know, you got all these cars on the same route, but the, you know, the, the passengers are taking different vehicles instead of sharing the same vehicle. In a neural network, this corresponds to sending all these signals that are sending similar information instead of just sending one signal and eliminating the redundancy. And if you look at, you know, how many signals are necessary, right? You can figure that out by looking at how the, the manifold, how the data is distributed, the data set is distributed mm -hmm. in that embedding space. And this is an example of a 2D, a 3D data set that lies on a 2D manifold. And so the intrinsic dimensionality will be two. Now, if you look at ImageNet, which is used to train these vision models, you've got 150,000 pixel images, but the intrinsic dimension is 35. So you only need to send, or the lower bound for signals is about 35. And in GPT-3, where you've got these 12,000 signals, the intrinsic dimension, the data lies on a 10-dimensional manifold. And so if now, you know, a silicon that, how, this is how a silicon brain could scale like a biological brain, Okay, you saw this data before, but now what you do is you take the L layers and stack them, and each layer has M neurons, and each neuron has M weights. But then you add an additional constraint where there's the number of signals is determined by the intrinsic dimension of the data set. And so now you've got one dimension in which things are constant, and the other two dimensions in which activity is increasing and lens of wires are increasing as you uh, make your 3D chip bitter, bigger. And so now you've got, since this is these di two dimensions give you the total number of neurons, your energy is scaling like uh, linear with the number of neurons. And that's how you match the brain scaling. So that's, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Kavina. Uh, so I will hand over then to Bill. Okay, let me stop my open. It doesn't seem to, uh, okay, here we go. <laughs> so hopefully you're seeing my screen. Yes. yes. Okay, um, so let me start by saying I agree with pretty much everything uh, Kovina said. Um, I think we do have, you know, an energy problem. And one thing we, you know, we're working on very hard is to but basically build GPUs and, and accelerators to make uh, computing neural networks um, much more efficient. I also think that um, advanced packaging can help almost all approaches to neural networks. 
and and we're constantly looking at more efficient encodings. I may even talk a little bit about that if uh, time permits. Let me try to figure out how to advance my slides here. Um, so let me first of all by, start by saying that I believe that what we build today using NVIDIA GPUs and our accelerators is neuromorphic, um, just as the spiking neural networks are, are neuromorphic, because they're all inspired by the brain. Um, you know, if you start with you know, the McCulloch and Pitts neuron, it looks very much like you know, what we have inside of GPT-3 or inside of BERT or inside of an image transformer. We've got a bunch of neurons that basically do a dot product of weights and activations, and then we apply a nonlinear activation function to that. I think that's in common of all of these different approaches. I think the real debate here is not to be neuromorphic or not. I think we all agree that neuromorphic is, is doing wonderful things across artificial intelligence. The real debate is whether we should be building spiking neural network chips or not. Um, and so what this really boils down to, um, you know, if you look at the sort of people who, who do spiking neural networks and, and people who do what I'll call more conventional neural networks is uh, four things. Um, in conventional neural networks, we actually work very hard to encode the data efficiently. Uh, we spent a lot of time over the last decade evolving from back in our um, you know, Fermi generation, everybody using FP32 um, to do things, going to FP16, to Bfloat, to TF32, and, and just at the ML uh, Sys conference, we presented an encoding called um, VS Quant that actually does even better than either an integer or float by itself by um, you know, doing scaling over very fine, fine dimensions. But we're, we're sort of using integer floating point numbers scaled very appropriately as our data representation. As I'll show in a minute, that's very efficient. Spiking neural networks tend to represent activations with a pulse train. And I think that this is great if your goal is to run experiments to simulate how the brain works, to basically test th theories of, of biology through simulation. But if your goal is to build a neural network to do language models or image segmentation or something like that, it's horribly inefficient by a factor of two to three orders of magnitude. Um, and I'll, I'll go into some more detail on that. Then, although many people who do build spiking chips like the Intel folks do digital, um, most conventional neural networks are digital and, and the spiking networks are analog. I'll talk about why digital is the right answer there. Um, we tend to use relatively simple activation functions for the conventional networks because they work well. Um, ReLU or sigmoid or, or a few other uh, simple nonlinear functions are typically employed. A lot of the spiking networks, again, in analogy to the brain, a, a real neuron is a very complex thing that integrates over time and, and you know, has very complex time varying weights, um, and very often those those are mimicked. And again, for simulation of biology, that's great. For actually, you know, doing image recognition, it's it's not the greatest thing. And then there's a the question of what model you're running. Um, today, transformers have kind of taken over the world for both you know images and language models. Um, we still use you know convolutional neural networks for many things. And the spiking um, you know, people tend to have their own unique models. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. But let me start with data representation. Um, you can think of any data representation as encoding a piece of information, a distribution, into a set of bits. And the two questions you have to ask yourself is what is the precision and what is the dynamic range? Um, and if you look at spiking, it's really sort of a, a unary encoding. You're encoding a number by how many pulses occur during a given period of time. And so, you know, let's say that we're going to have a period of time we can have from 1 to 256 spikes. That's essentially the equivalent of int eight, which can can represent um, numbers of that same magnitude, um, and and it has the same characteristic that the dynamic range is is up to um, you know one to two fifty six, and the precision is on the order of a couple percent. Um, we can do much better with logarithmic or or floating point number representations that basically because they have error that's proportional to the magnitude at, at the same time actually have much better precision. Um, and you can trade off the dynamic range by bits between the exponent and the mantissa. The best you can do, actually, is a, from this point of view, is a symbolic representation, uh, where we basically have a, um, a lookup table that is a uh, sampling our distribution densely where the distribution is dense and sparsely where the distribution is sparse. But the reasons why you don't want to do that, because it's energetically efficient um, for transport, but not for operations. So the other question is, how much energy does this take? And we can break the energy into two pieces. One is how much does it take to move the data? And, and for the encodings where we just simply take a bit encoding and send it across, it's proportional to the number of bits. So the SIM6 is, is the best here. Um, and and uh, FP16 is the worst because it's 16 bits. Um, spike doesn't fit on the scale. It's 50,000 on this um, scale. So it's off you know, several rooms off, off to the right of my screen. 
And the reason for that is, much as Quivina said, electrical signals, it's like filling up a hose with water um, is the energy here. And here we have to fill the hose with water and empty it and fill it with water again and empty it. And it basically every time you toggle this signal, that dissipates CV squared of energy on, on the wire that you're driving. Um, and so whereas these, um, a typical, you know, 8-bit representation will change half of the bits, so it's changing four bits, which means it's toggling two bits. Um, here to represent the average number, which is 128, we toggle 128 times. So it's 64 times as much energy as an, as an 8-bit representation. Um, and this is also where the SIM8 does poorly on the operation part of the scale, because we have to decode it, looking up at the code book is expensive, and then do high precision arithmetic to actually do the operation. Now, many people have proposed building analog um, neural networks. Most popular here is using solid state um, memory technology, and at each cross point of the solid state network, storing not a one or a zero, but, but basically putting enough charge on that floating gate of that transistor to store a weight. And then you put the input activations on the word lines of that, and you measure the current um, on the bit lines of that. And it basically does a, a dot product of the weights and the activations. And those individual operations are very efficient on, on the order of, of a, um, you know, a couple of femtojoules per, per operation. But the problem is you ultimately have to move the result of that somewhere and in either space or time. And moving it in time means storing it in memory and reading it back out. And there really aren't efficient analog memories, or it's also not very efficient to move something at very high precision in analog any distance. So movement in time or space requires converting to digital. And if you... Um, convert to digital and you want to retain precision to match, for example, the equivalent of 8-bit precision, you wind up in the range of this, you know, half a, a picojoule to a picojoule per multiply accumulate um, to be competitive. And that winds up making it an order of magnitude less efficient than, than the most efficient digital um, neural networks to date. Um, so the current state of the art, this is a paper that's under review right now at the VLSI Circuit Symposium. I'm showing the reference for the earlier work from, from our group. Um, we, we actually have working in the lab right now, um, running BERT large with no loss of precision compared to FP32 at 120 teraops per watt. So think of this as, you know, on the order of eight femtojoules per, per operation. That's what you need to compare with um, if you want to compare an analog or, or a spiking neural network. Because uh, this is what really matters if you, um, you know, want to avoid, you know, um, excessive carbon emissions to the atmosphere is how, you know, what is your teraops per watt? Um, for your know, wait times activation functions at a precision that gives you no loss compared to FP32. Too often people tend to compare, you know, back to a Fermi or Kepler generation GPU, um, which by the way is about three orders of magnitude worse than this. So if, if the goal is to get 170 times larger battery for your cell phone, all you need to do is use state-of-the-art um, techniques rather than running it um, on your ARM core. Um, for the models, um, basically, that there's a bunch of well-known uh, you know, benchmarks for, for language, for speech, and then for the overall system, an organization, MLPerf, has been created so that people can compare in a level playing field um, who, who does the, the best on different things from imaging to speech recognition to natural language processing. And um, you know, you'll see there are entries from Intel and Xilinx, Qualcomm and NVIDIA, but nobody has a spiking network on these because they simply don't compete um, on the standard benchmarks. So let me draw an analogy. I think um, our aircraft that we fly today, if you fly from um, one end of a continent to another, are aeromorphic in the sense that the pioneers of aviation, um, you, know, uh, you know, the Wright brothers and others, were inspired by watching birds. And they learned a lot about aerodynamics, about airflow over wings and lift and drag um, from watching birds, about, about control and the like. Um, but when it came time to build an aircraft, um, they decided to build it from aluminum or carbon fiber and to power it with turbines rather than to build it with feathers and flapping wings. Because while they were inspired by the birds, they realized that literally mimicking what the birds do is not a very efficient way of, of air transport. So let me wrap up by saying that I think all the neural networks we build today are neuromorphic. So I, I do agree that neuromorphic um, you know, machines are the future of, of computing. Um, and they're neuromorphic in the sense that they're brain inspired by observing how the brain works um, and you know, moving from the you know, McCulloch and Pitts on to where we are today. Uh, we've made huge progress in AI. Um, I think spiking neural networks are useful for biological simulations. If I want to take a small piece of, of the nervous system of some animal and understand how it works, I can probe that and then recreate it in, in simulation 
to test my theories of, of how that functions. But it's not a good way of um, building neural networks for the purpose of you know, perception in a self-driving vehicle or a question and answering system using natural language processing. The, the first is that it, spiking is a very inefficient number representation. It's 64 times worse um, than int eight on an energy basis. And, and trying to do computations in analog, if, if people view that as part of the spiking um, dogma, is 10 times more energy because of the cost of conversion. And you need to convert to move things in time or space, and you have to move them in time or space. Any computation is not completely localized. If you're going to compare against things, you need to compare against a, a state-of-the-art uh, deep learning accelerator. Our magnet is currently 120 teraops per watt, um, not the order of you know 100 gigaops per watt um, from the uh, you know, Kepler Fermi generation GPUs. This is three orders of magnitude better. And that's, I think, the, 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 the point of comparison you need to look, look at. And when it comes to models, I think you have to compare as well-established bench, benchmarks, you know, whether it's ImageNet, if you're doing image classification, um, a number of the you know, blue scores for, for natural language processing. And MLPerf, I think, nicely wraps that up um, you know, in a well-established benchmark suite. And I don't see any of the spiking networks competing there. If they actually outperformed conventional neural networks, they would be sweeping the MLPerf um, numbers um, on, on natural language processing, image classification, and other things. So thank you very much for your time. I look forward to the discussion part of this. Yeah, thanks, uh, Bill. So uh, I will now hand over to Ralph. So we, you are muted, Ralph. Ah, there. That's Hello. Good. Uh, how are you guys? Hope all is, hope everybody is well. I don't have a um, a slideshow, uh, but I will kind of try to uh, address directly um, the various um, ideas that's been raised uh, by both Fabiana and uh, Bill. So I will start first by saying that neuromorphic engineering is not multiply accumulate. Um, it's not that. It's not about max. It's way more than that. In fact, the dynamics, the, the, the change of signals is as important, even more important than just basically the weighting and, and, and accumulate. So, so to have a system that's built on mainly on max is, is by my view, uh, problematic by, you know, by, by the start, right? So, we, so that essentially to me kind of makes you know, Bill's argument uh, a little bit about the fact that what, it, what um, you know, what the GPUs do are, as neuromorphic a little bit less, less solid by my, uh, by my perspective. Second thing that I would say is that it is almost never the case that you would see a, a signal being represented as toggling of bits in a neuromorphic system in the sense of um, you know, spike, 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 like 20 spikes mean something uh, different than, um, you know, than 23 spikes, typically. What's usually the case is it's the inter-spike interval that matters, it's time. So the beauty of uh, neuromorphic engineering in the sense of, of using spikes in this case, so, although I'm leaving that a bit open at the moment, in using spikes is the inter-spike interval, right? It's the impact of an arriving spike and the next arriving spike, as opposed to trying to, <clears throat> excuse me, supposed to trying to toggle spikes along the way just to represent that number. If you do what you articulated, uh, Bill, I, I agree with you that it would be inefficient, but I think there are many more ways that we can take advantage of the timing in order to make a more efficient um, uh, signal representation that would ultimately lead to even more efficient uh, representation. So, Going back a little bit now to, to Kwabena's uh, perspective, that it's a 3D structure, that you know, we have to take advantage of 3D and so on. And, and I completely agree with, with, with that arrangement that, um, that Kwabena has pointed out, especially now that we get into the point where we can do computing memory, where local memory can also participate in that computation. Uh, but I think that also another element of, um, of neuromorphic engineering, I would call it 3D plus, right? Where the plus is not just the representation of the signal, but it's other signals um, that are also being part of the computation. And in a you know, neurobiological sense, those other signals are in the form of neurochemicals that are bathing the, you know, the, the networks that are part of the, um, 
you know, part of the computation. So, um, so we see then that, you know, that we are constructing a network that is not just about the neurons anymore. We are, you know, synapses matter, you know, how many of them matters. The timing of those synaptic um, uh, releases matter. On top of that, we've got now other uh, representation of signal in the, in the milieu where all the, you know, all the uh, neurons and so on and synapses live. And all those together cannot be adequately represented by a um, uh, by a more traditional digital system without doing a lot of work to get it to to, to be represented that way, and that ultimately to you know to gain the benefits from uh, from those implementations. So I think in the end, the final reconstruction, if you will, of a, of a biologically um, uh, real percent or or uh, decision is going to take a lot of hardware to actually try to make it happen so the one um uh, so uh, yeah so so with that in mind then I, I see the future of computation in a slightly different manner i see it more as a um as a dance between biology and um electronics and what i mean by that is that we should you know, take advantage of biological networks and take advantage of electronics networks in the same way that, that we've been talking about just now um, and have them work together in such a way that you can take advantage of some of the um, uh, representations that are just almost impossible to represent um, from, from a simulation perspective. So that means um, now there's a new kind of a field, well, not new, but the field is getting a little bit more you know, traction in this notion that we can grow networks of neurons from um, IPS, uh, from um, stem cells in the ditch. You can grow mini brains or mini retinas or mini, you know, parts of the uh, cortex. And are there ways for us then to interface with those grown uh, networks, you know, grown uh, components of the nervous system, in addition to having them communicate with our electronics in order for the um, uh, for the computation to be done, and I would argue then that you know if we want to get to a point where we have a large number of variables in the um, you know in the network that that is being um, computed, there is very you know very few other um, implementations that we could that we could do that would have the the, the three D structure that Cabana articulated and the interactions between the different um, uh, elements of, uh, of computation, as well as the chemicals, as well as all these other aspects that we tend to ignore entirely in our in our neural networks and our you know kind of model of AI, um, that is where we would maybe benefit from uh, from having really the next phase of um, you know of uh, supercomputers. I also believe that at the point where we where we are going to benefit from from supercomputers and and um, you know and, and making sure that uh, yeah, that, that we are developing these machines that can compute at the same type of of uh, accuracy, if you will, or or, or sophistication as we have in uh, in humans and in animals, is that it's going to have to be a place where you know. Uh, we are building prosthetic devices, or we're building um, uh, medicine uh, applications of, of neuromorphics, where you basically have part of the nervous system being replaced by part or by, by some electronic or some other uh, representation of, of, uh, of neural systems. And to do that, you have to make them speak the same language, right? You know, if you, the moment that you have to go between ADD conversion and DDA conversions, I think you, you run into a problem. So then having the nervous system and the silicon speaking the same language means operating them at the voltages that are equivalent, if you will, right? 150 millivolts or lower. Um, and then uh, to do that, then to have again speak in spite and having the density of, of interconnections and so on. So that's where I think the, the, the additional, the next step in the future comes in, right? Is what are those, you know, those means by which you interface the artificial with the real. Um, uh, so um, essentially artificial intelligence with natural intelligence. 
how do you bring them together? Um, and uh, to do that, uh, we need to get new materials. You know, we need to get new uh, new ways of, of thinking about interface and, and uh, new encoding mechanism that is also uh, maybe uh, biologically plausible and biologically um, uh, compatible. I guess is the right word. Um, so all this is to say that um, you know that I you know I see the future of um, you know of computing um, in the neuromorphic space as being a combination then of um, of living and artificial speaking together in a in a in a common language that is essentially going to end up being spiking language uh, where the third dimension can be taking advantage of and we're not thinking about 2D chips anymore but 3D and and then the fourth dimension being being um, uh, the uh, uh, with time but also other representational signal also being represented in our in our uh, uh, computational system and that is you know where the research right now is not really touching, right? I mean, I think, and just to finish up, I think, you know, the moment that I see, you know, Intel and IBM and NVIDIA and, and companies of that sort getting into a field, to me, means that that field is, is not, it is basically saturated in a sense of its growth, right? Now you're just trying to make it better and better and better, right? It's not innovative. <laughs> and that's maybe my, my, you know, my, my little point, you know, little tip. Um, but uh, I think the innovation comes in the next form of organization. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ralph, for your sharing your opinion. So now, uh, finally, I would like to hand over to Jan. All right. All right. Oops. I full screen the wrong thing, I'm sorry. All right. Okay, so should should deep learning or AI hardware be neuromorphic? So uh, first of all, I agree with a lot of, uh, you know, what uh, Kovina, Bill and, 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 and Ralph have said. Um, you know, probably more with what Bill says than uh, <laughs> uh, than, than than Ralph or Kovina. But I think I think I think we agree on what the problems are. Uh, I'm not entirely sure we we see the the horizon, uh, the time horizon at which we have to solve those problems uh, or get to that goal. Uh, perhaps it's different. I mean, certainly for Ralph, it's different. I think. Um, and certainly the way to get there might be might be different for, for various reasons. So let me do a little bit of history for you. Um, and that history is, uh, I used to work at Bell Labs and I was in a group that was basically working on microfabrication. And the first thing they did was, you know, they talked to John Huffield, who at the time uh, was at Caltech, but also part-time at Bell Labs. And, and, and John told them, you should build uh, electronic uh, neural nets. And so the first thing they did was build a resistor array using EBM lithography, and it was a you know a tiny array. They eventually made made bigger ones. This was before I joined that group, a couple of years before I joined that group. Um, and then they quickly realized that you know they had to connect amplifiers to those things, and the amplifiers would basically uh, dominate the size of the entire thing, and it wasn't programmable. So the next generation chip was actually a programmable chip that had ternary weights plus one, minus one, or zero, um, that you know made it somewhat flexible. Um, and it had amplifiers and everything, but the problem there is that the chip was much faster than, uh, you know, it could be fed from from the outside. Uh, and so what happened uh, over the next few years is that, you know, convolutional nets kind of started appearing, certainly at Bell Labs, because I joined, uh, or, you know, in 1988. And so the next chip was, uh, the, the next two chips were actually convolution chips. And uh, they solved the problem of, you know, feeding the, the chip fast enough by using shift registers because you know there is a lot of data reuse in a convolution, so so that that's what kind of solved that problem. But there was still um, so th these were all analog. Uh, this third chip here, Net32K, um, was um, uh, doing sort of um, analog products, but since it was ternary ternary weights and, and binary activations, it was kind of easy. And then the the sum was just a wire, right? Uh, and it could do 320 billion operations, one bit uh, uh, operations per second, which is kind of uh, gigantic for the time. 
um, almost simultaneously, Bernard Bozer, Eddie Sackinger, and a few of us uh, worked on the ENA chip, which was basically a ConvNet chip. It was really designed to implement com uh, convolutional nets. And this one used six bit weights because we figured we could quantize the weights on six bits and the states on three bits, at least for things like LUNET 1, 2, 5, and it would still work fine. And this, this could do uh, four billion operations per second. So this, you know, there's a long history, but what you see is an evolution from completely analog to partly digital to, you know, mostly digital with a little bit of analog inside. And so in fact, um, what, uh, you know, what, what, what happened here is that um, the, 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 last, uh, the, last, the last chip, the, the, the ANA chip was using multiplying uh, uh, digital to analog converters for the, for the multipliers and, uh, uh, and, and stored the, the weights on capacitors. And there's an issue with this, which is that, you know, you have to make the capacitors kind of big if you want to store uh, voltages to any kind of precision and be able to uh, refresh them from the outside, you, you know, uh, um, like, like a dynamic RAM, basically. Um, but then, so uh, so then the, you know, at and split up, and so the, 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 the whole group was disbanded. But, but uh, the hardware people, Eddie Sackinger in particular, continued working on uh, what at first was um, neural net chips that were fully digital. They were basically kind of, uh, you know, MIMD uh, DSPs with sort of 16-bit vector instruction. Um, that chip ended up not being used for neural nets, but it ended up being used for things like signal processing for uh, cell phone towers and, you know, uh, this, this kind of stuff and video and video compression, that kind of stuff. And, it, you, know, it be, it, you know, it came very close to what uh, general purpose uh, GPUs are, are doing today. Um, I stopped doing hardware for a while, but then kind of revived this when people started to get interested in, in, in convolutional nets again. And so we worked on this thing called NewFlow, which was a data flow architecture um, uh, in the, the late 2000s and uh, early 2010s. Uh, eventually a chip was designed uh, around this by uh, Eugenio Cruciello's group um, um, at Purdue, but um, it wasn't actually, actually able to, um, to test it. But the reason I'm telling you this is because uh, eventually, we collaborated with uh, uh, Bernabe Linares Barranco uh, from Spain, and and we wrote this paper where we try to compare uh, sort of you know classical you know data flow digital implementations of convolutional, convolutional nets with uh, uh, basically AER you know address event uh, representations, uh, spiking neuron like uh, implementations that Bernabe is kind of a big fan of, and. You know, um, as uh, um, as Bill was was saying, uh, it's just not not in the game. It's 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 far behind uh, in terms of performance when when you know you put everything together. Um, and I have the same analogy here that uh, Bill used. Um, you guys may some of some of you may know about uh, Clément Adair. So Clément Adair was a pioneer of aviation. Uh, in France, he actually built a steam-powered airplane that took off on its own power in 1890. Um, that was 13 years before the Wright brothers, and you never heard of him. And the reason, except he's for French, but you never heard of him because, um, you know, his, you know, it was a dead end. You know, he had copied bats basically. He modeled his air, uh, airplane on on the on bats, and his airplane was able to take off because it was a really good um, steam engine designer. But it was not. It was basically not controllable. Um, he built a couple of those airplanes. Uh, uh, it's, you know, still debatable whether some of them took off or not. Um, he left a legacy, though, which is that he called his airplane uh, l'avion, and that's what we call airplanes in French, Spanish, and Portuguese. So there is a legacy there, but um, uh, but you know why why is it that you, you you never heard of him? I think he he sort of got inspired by biology, but perhaps a little too close. And perhaps without understanding some of the basic principles that, uh, you know, really are important for for flight, things like stability and controllability and and things like that, you know, he understood something about aerodynamics, obviously. Um, so, what aspects of biological neural nets are relevant that we should try to copy, and what are the ones that we should not try to copy? Um, so, things that we don't copy are things like self-assembly, you know, things, you know, power source, you know, which is basically sugar. Um, electrobiochemical computation. This is what the brain uses. And we're not even trying to copy this. Um, should we copy analog synapses? The fact that um, you know synapses in the brain are, are essentially analog. And, and the question really comes down to what is the smallest, most efficient uh, multiplier? Is it digital or not? 
should we use spikes? It's a big question. Uh, they're good for transmitting sparse activations efficiently, um, but um, but as you know, Bill kind of said, um, they're not that great. In fact, uh, compared to uh, the, the sort of more classical alternative in, in sort of digital CMOS. Uh, what's interesting is that um, the brains of large animals uh, use spike, uh, but tiny animals like C. elegans, which is about one millimeter long and has 302 neurons, um, their neurons are not spiking because they don't need to transmit information very far. And so they don't need spikes. So spikes is really kind of a, a transmission uh, device that biology has figured out. Um, but is it is it really useful? Not clear. There are many aspects of biological neural nets that are relevant that we are copying, which is why I agree with Bill when he says that all of our hardware is neuromorphic in some way. Um, so, you know, we use locally connected neurons that are, you know, pretty much well identical in convolutional nets, for example, particularly in, uh, you know, sort of inspired from sensory uh, cortical areas. We use rectifications in the form of values. We use normalization, divisive normalization that we observe in V1, things like batch norm, layer norm, et cetera. Um, we use uh, associative memories uh, that uh, neuroscientists say you know, are present in the hippocampus. Uh, memory networks and transformer style self-attention basically are, one, are associative memory. And you, can, you can write into them in one shot, so they're kind of, they can learn quickly. This is what uh, you know, all the GPTs and large language models are based on, or transformers, basically. Um, you know, we, we, we have synapse-synapse interaction equivalent uh, in the form of uh, uh, basically multiplicative interactions, which which is what attention uses. Um, one thing we don't use yet, or, or we use, but probably not in the same way the brain uh, does, is uh, self-supervised learning. I mean, what is the learning algorithm of the cortex? We still don't know. Um, it's somewhat mysterious. Um, and, it, you know, it might be gradient-based. So here is a bunch of things that I think just are not relevant and should not be copied and probably are dead ends, in my opinion, okay? And I'm, I'm going on a limb here. So I don't believe in reservoir computing. I think re random weights are inefficient and don't really work for anything useful. We need to learn the weights. Um, so that's just a, a way to kind of, uh, you know, not have to learn the weights by making a network really large. I don't believe in this approach at all. Um, weighted dates. Uh, a lot of people in the hardware community and neuromorphic hardware community are very fond of STDP uh, and some biologists also. Uh, STDP doesn't do anything useful. You can't do anything with STDP. STDP is a side effect of something complicated that we don't understand, some underlying rule that we don't understand. And we need to figure out what is this underlying rule because if we just copy STDP, we don't, we don't get anything that's interesting. Um, my hypothesis is that the brain probably uses some form of self-supervised learning, whatever you mean by that. Probably some sort of objective is being minimized. Almost certainly, if, if that's the case, uh, the gradient of this objective is being estimated. Um, so, you know, we know that backprop works. We know that target propagation works, which is sort of a form of backprop. Um, I think this is what, you know, uh, if we want to uh, implement learning on chip, which I think is actually a bad idea, that's probably what we should do. Um, there's a whole bunch of problems with analog that Bill went through uh, in, in details. Um, I think I, I will just focus on, uh, on, on one, which is that, um, uh, in, in analog hardware, it's, it's difficult to implement, which means that you basically need to have a one physical neuron or synapse per neuron or synapse in your in your neural net. Otherwise, you're going to have to have storage, memory storage, and then kind of shuffle data through uh, a, a computing engine uh, to and from memory, and that's what uh, really kind of consumes uh, power and energy. Um, so, you know. Our, our technology is is both too big and too fast. We uh, we we it's not small enough that we can fit an entire neural net uh, with sort of one physical synapse and neuron per, um, per 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 neuron in our in our in our hardware. Um, what digital technology allows us to do is hardware reuse. And given the speed and size of our of our fabrication technology, I think that's what we have to do. We have to do hardware reuse, which means we have to pump data through uh, processing elements essentially. Um, unfortunately, that's what kills us in terms of power. It's uh, shuffling data to and from uh, memory, even if it's local. Um, and so to the question, can neuromorphic design be useful in the medium term? Uh, and I'm talking like, you know, five, 10 years. You know, I, I want those, you know, assistants that uh, Kwabina was talking about, but I don't want them in 20 years. I want them in five or 10 years. Um, 
And so, uh, you know, people are putting a lot of resources into uh, neural net accelerators that using essentially conventional digital CMOS design. Uh, what is not conventional is things like, you know, asynchronous clocks and dynamic voltage lowering and things like that to kind of save power. And there is a huge need for this in, uh, for, you know, applications like uh, augmented reality glasses where you need sort of built-in uh, AI and neural nets if you want. So a short-term future is going to be something like, you know, a RISC-V core with, you know, a variable precision neural net accelerator. I mean, I, I don't think we can get out of this. This is for low end, right? For high end, uh, uh, you know, Bill and his friends have, have have a lock on that, but for, you know, for like training and things like that, but uh, also sort of low end inference. Um, uh, this may be where, where the world is going. Uh, this may be the new standard for, you know, microcontrollers. And it will go into everything from you know AR glasses to phones, cars, robots, cameras, vacuum cleaners, toys, um, etc. Um, so what are the trends in AI uh, and, and deep learning? As, as Kovina said, the number of uh, synapses or, or connections in neural nets is, is growing really quickly and needs to grow quickly because uh, we um, you know we're, we're going to a world where we pre-train all those models using self-supervised running and then we sort of fine tune in for uh, any tasks that we have. And if you want a multilingual, real-time speech-to-speech -speech translation system, you know it's going to have on the order of, you know, a trillion uh, synapses or something like that. So, um, you know, we're going to train on GPU clusters or things that are similar to that. You know, maybe TPUs or something of that of that um, flavor. And then inference uh, on data centers will be on sort of various hardware, including digital uh, uh, custom digital hardware. Um, but then what about very low power systems for wearable uh, devices, mobile embedded devices? I mean, certainly for sensor processing, you want you might want something that's kind of more neuromorphic. Um, uh, how do you get the, the power down for, you know, AR glasses where you have to fit, you know, everything in the branch of your uh, of your glasses? Um, and how you run, you know, virtual assistants that are, you know, basically human-like intelligence on, on device? Uh, we're not uh, anywhere near that yet. And we need, you know, a couple orders of magnitude uh, progress for that. Um, okay, so uh, last question is: Will exotic technology change the landscape? And I'm really curious about this. Um, you know, to ask, uh, you know, all of you uh, because I'm not an expert. Um, uh, you know, can can we make uh, synapses small enough with new technology that an entire functional neural net will fit on a single chip uh, while avoiding hardware multiplexing and and therefore avoiding uh, problem with uh, you know storage and stuff like that. Uh, you know, could it be mem memory stiff devices? There's a lot of papers on this. You know, over the last few years, um, not clear where that's going. Uh, could it be you know graphene-based uh, memory stirs or whatever? Maybe that would bring the power down. Uh, could it be uh, spintronics? You know, that's kind of a new thing as well. There's a lot of work there on the spintronics for neural nets. Um, uh, there's even those things of you know spin wave uh, interference, uh, which is sort of really kind of spooky, uh, but but somewhat somewhat interesting. Um, will it be holographic, optical? Um, you know, a convolution is basically a lens, right? So it would seem uh, logical. There was a lot of work on this also in the 1980s. Uh, it didn't it didn't go anywhere. Um, there's a lot of issues there that are similar to analog in terms of uh, conversions and everything. But but it's a good question to to figure out, like, is there going to be some revolutionary fabrication technology or, or underlying technology that's going to change the landscape, would allow us to basically put, a, you know, a completely hardwired, uh, a useful neural net on the, on the, on the, you know, single chip. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jan, and thanks to to everybody. So, uh, so I so I found all this presentation very, very interesting and delighting. So, uh, I, and I had a feeling that there might be a lot of differences, but there was also a lot of agreement uh, on certain points. So the question is uh, about the bird. So which parts of the birds are, are crucial and which are not crucial? So I, I, I furthermore, I, rec I recognize some kind of uh, unfair situation with respect to the first speaker, because everybody else could somehow uh, somehow comment already on the previous speaker. So I would like uh, if, if Kwabena agrees I would like to give the word to him uh, to uh, to comment on on his uh, su uh, successors
Same problem I was having for a minute. Finding. I hear you. Oh, you know. Your your voice is fine for us. Oh, I say good. Now it's working. Now you can hear me, right? Yes, yes, everything's yes. fine. So, uh, yeah, so these were all, I'm taking rubbing my notes, but um, <laughs> these were all fascinating talks, and thanks, everybody, for uh, your comments and so forth. This is, of course, uh, Jan and I go way back. I remember the days when he was making chips, and he was always showing live, live demos in his talks. It's nice to hear about all that history, and we've all been through that history together, um, and I think we all know each other for decades. So it's really fun to hear everybody's uh, perspective and so forth and you know creativity comes from your personal experience it's individual and so we are all you know creating the things we do because you know we have a unique perspective and I encourage people to you know approach that you know figure out what's unique about their background and, and follow that and um, and so but the main point I want to make here which has come up several times is the bed versus plane analogy and then the other point I want to make is the level of abstraction, right? And so the bird versus plane analogy, my response to that is, you know, the birds and the planes are not solving the same problem. The birds are not, they've been around for like millions of years, even billions of years, and their planet is still here. They are not making a hole in the ozone layer. They are not destroying the planet and so forth. So the planes are doing, are not solving the same problem, okay? And that comes down in our terms, that comes down to the efficiency, the energy efficiency, how sustainable the approach is. And I haven't heard either Bill or, or Jan address this sustainability issue, neither or the equitability issue. Now, um, that's one on the bird side and versus the plane. And then that leads into my second point, which I've thought about a lot over the past several decades, given all this history, and what we've been, what we've tried and so forth, is that, you know, the way I think about the right level of abstraction is that, you know, if you look at a computer or any computing system, the things that determine the fundamental exponent with which it scales as you make the tasks more difficult, how much does your energy increase, right? That doesn't have to do with algorithms. It doesn't have to do with some sophisticated, very clever software and so forth. It has to do with the way that the hardware represents information, the primitive data representation of the hardware and the primitive computational or the basic computational equations that the hardware is capable of. This is how you go from a problem that's exponentially hard with a conventional computer to a problem that's polynomially easy with a quantum computer by replaces by replacing ors and ands with entanglement and superposition and classical bits with quantum bits. This is just showing you that it's the, so the question really is, what are the right basic data representations we should be, that the brain is using, we should get that right, and what are the basic computational parameters that the brain is using? If we get those two things right, that, and we, and we pick the right things, then we are going to be able to achieve what I call neural supremacy, like the quantum guys achieve quantum supremacy. And, you know, this came up in spikes and spike rates and so forth, I agree with Bill, spike rate is not the way to go. I think that the basic unit of information in the brain is a sequence of spikes. This is like unary signals that are representing a very high radix number. And that radix is the number of neurons in the, in the, in the, uh, in the layer. And each one, by sending a spike, can you know, send a particular symbol. And then a sequence of spikes is giving you several digits of a unary number. And so this gives you the sparsity, it gives you all that that you need there. And then you need something that can decode or support that representation in the hardware. And this is what dendrites are doing. They are sensitive to not just one spike or even the weights don't matter. It's the order in which uh, spikes come into a segment of dendrite that determines whether it responds or not by generating a plateau potential. So if I had more time, I'll get into these details, but this is what we've learned about the brain in the last 10 years which is going to inform the next generation of neuromorphic hardware, just like we've been doing since the 40s and 50s. So thank you. Okay, so concerning this uh, this uh, this spike, I mean, for, for you, Corina, that was crucial uh, to have the spiking. But uh, in general, one could also say that uh, perhaps the spikes are not what is useful uh, in the birds. Uh, 
and, and then we don't have to transfer the spiking to to the artificial neural yeah, networks. So, in my, in so my you talk, would not agree on this. So you would say the spikes are a key. No, in my talk I didn't mention spikes. You never had the word spikes. Okay. The, the problem here is to sparsify. And in okay. a 3D in a 3D kind of uh, brain or 3D chip, it has to get sparser as it gets bigger because your surface area is increasing quadratically and your your heat you're generating is increasing cubically, right? And so I said I mentioned spikes. It's really about the primitive data representation. You should be looking for data representation that allows you to compute in 3D. So it has to satisfy this thermal constraint. And the brain has done that. And, and just a spike is not a code, just like how a bit is not a code. You know, uh, Bill mentioned like five different ways he can use bits to represent information. That's a code, right? And so, and so a spike is like some signal, right? It's a signal representation, but it's not a data representation. Right. And so the question is, what, how do you represent information? And, okay. and you know, this is the point. And, and I think if you pick the right, the brain is not using, you know, there are spikes in the brain, but they are not the basic okay. unit of information. Okay, Ralph, like, you, you yeah. had a comment. Pardon me? Uh, um, right. so, okay. Yeah, so, so I totally agree, right? I mean, in the sense that it's the, it's the, Assemble that matters, right? It's not the it's not the unique um, notion of the spike itself. But I think there is a place where spike becomes, or at least the notion of a of a, um, a quantized level and and time um, analog representation becomes very useful. And that is when our um, our power supplies just start squeezing down on the noise flow, right? To the point where you will not have multi levels. To represent you know, analog values, if you will, right? And the only way to represent analog values, is, you know, in a continuous way, is to look at inter-events. So, so it's not so much spikes in the classical sense; it's whatever you call an event, right? It's just that so so happens that when we talk about neural networks, we we tend to think of, uh, about it in terms of spike. But it's that inter-event um, interval that matters, and also from a signal-to-noise perspective, a um, a, a quantized level um, is better um, for represent uh, in in, the net, in an environment where you have very small power supplies. You know, and you get it close to the thermal noise, and that's where it becomes useful. Yeah. Can I comment on two things that that yeah. Kovina said? So the first is I, I think we are working very hard on sustainability. Um, so I'll take take issue with that. I actually, if you if I could share a screen, I could show a chart here, but I'll describe it um, in the meantime. Where if you look at the ops you know, per watt of a CPU, you're on the okay. So we show screen three here. Um, it's not in slideshow mode, and that's fine. Um, okay, pops up a little thing. Okay, um, you know, a CPU is a couple billion um, ops per watt. Um, just by moving to a GPU, you get about two orders of magnitude. That's a huge um, gain in sustainability. Um, when we added tensor cores to our GPUs, which is basically hardwired accelerators to do matrix multiplies we got another order of magnitude and now with with our very fine-tuned accelerators um you know we're, we're getting another order of magnitude and a half so there's you know four and a half orders of magnitude that we have gained over just doing neural networks on cpus i think that's a huge um jump in, in sustainability and i think certainly more than you would get by moving to analog or doing doing any of the other things um that are said so let me uh, stop sure you you little... that <laughs> what's that I didn't say I didn't mention the word analog in my talk. Yeah, um, and then let me talk about data representation because I think that's actually key here, and I think that our goal to to achieving efficiency is actually coming up with the right data representation at two levels. In, in the but small, also using 3D. Well, that that's a packaging technology. I, I think that you know we we may go to 3D, we may not. We're we're stacking yeah, memories. You're already, already using it in your HPMs. You know, there's eight chips yeah. stacked in there. Yeah, yeah, but but you know we we, we have to look at what. You know that, that's that's a gain of of you know going from you know you know n squared to n three half. It, it's it's not going to be huge. What is huge is coming up with representations that that basically use the least amount of energy to represent the information at hand. And this happens at two levels. At the at the fine level, it's representing weights and activations. And we we have found that that using you know you know variations between integer and logarithmic representation with a small number of bits is extremely efficient at, at the fine scale, especially when scale factors are then applied to basically put the dynamic range where it does the most good. The other representation is really the model, right? Because it's saying at the large scale, what is connected to what? 
Um, and, and that's where I think there's a lot of room for creativity and, and sparsity definitely plays in. We've, we've worked very hard. Um, so Jan wrote the original paper on sparse neural networks back in the 90s, but we worked very hard after sort of rediscovering it around 2015 to actually get performance out of that. And what we found is the irregularity of sparsity makes it very hard to have a sparse computation compete with a dense computation unless mm -hmm. it's really sparse, like, you know, 0.01% dense. Yeah, no, it's um, not. But, but, we, but we've, we've turned the corner on that. I mean, um, our Ampere <laughs> GPUs have support for structured sparsity, and we're, we're putting a lot more things in to allow us to have sparse interconnect between things, because I think being able to represent that well is key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there, there's two kinds of... Uh, so first, I'm going to agree with Quavina connected to what you just said, Bill. Uh, there's two kinds of sparsity. One is sparsity of connections, of course, which we have to, to deal with uh, in things like, like, like ConvNets and, and other things. But then there is sparsity of activations. Yeah. And right now, our hardware, uh, you know, as you said, does not really take advantage of this and should. And as the networks that we are using are going to get bigger, the, they're going to be more and more sparse, right? So the brain is about 2% uh, activated, right? So you take any neuron at any, uh, you know, at some random time, uh, it's about, you know, 2% of its sort of maximum activation range, more or less. By, by the way, that's also the number for you. Know, Kovina said half the wires are toggling at any cycle in a digital chip. That's not true. I think we're running around 3% right. for GPU okay. today. Okay, yeah, and I um, think the brain is far less than 2%, and it depends on the size of the right. brain. <laughs> well, it depends on a lot of things. It depends also which area of the brain. Like V1 is not particularly sparse, but you know other yeah. areas are. If all the wires so, on a GPU were to toggle every other cycle, it would melt. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> right. we depend yeah. on that sparse yeah. activation. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. ways to explain, yeah. you know, the sparse activations would be would be great, uh, particularly yeah. as the, the networks are are going to become you know much bigger. Um, mm -hmm. there, there, ha there has to be a way to exploit this, and and then um, and then you know I think there's a trick that biology uses. I might be wrong about this, but you know, uh, a spike is only 70 millivolts, right? It's very, very, it's a very small amount of, you know, it's very small voltage, that, which is what Ralph was talking about. Uh, and also, it doesn't, you know, propagate like like when you charge the capacitor for an entire line, right? It's just like a, a soliton, right? That that sort of propagates yeah. energy-wise. So you know, we haven't figured out how to do this with electronics yet, or or, or any technology for that matter. Um, uh, to the sustainability uh, question. Now, right. there is, I think, a big misunderstanding there, which is that the total amount of uh, energy or power that, you know, AI systems uh, going forward are going to consume is not going to be much bigger than they currently are. Okay. Um, and the reason for this is economics. You know, we basically, uh, even if we used like, you know, 50 or 70 percent, you know, if Meta or Google or whatever used let's say 70% of their uh, data centers to run uh, neural nets. Um, it's not the case at the moment, it's lower, but it might get there, okay, when we get sort of more uh, sophisticated AI systems. The the economics of, of the whole things, you know, limits the number of data centers you can build. First of all, those data centers are all carbon neutral, so uh, that's true for both Google and, and, and Meta. Yeah. Uh, but then, uh, uh, you know, you, you just can't, kind of melt, you know, uh, or boil a, a small lake uh, just for running AI because it's not economically feasible. And so what people are doing is that the amount of power that's consumed to run AI system is more or less constant. You know, it grows, a little, you know, but not, not, not very quickly. Uh, but what grows is the number of operations, you know, per, per joule, right? Um, you know, because of the technology that Bill is, is talking about. And so the total amount of computation spent in AI is growing really quickly but the amount of power, electrical power, is not. Mm -hmm. It's basically constant. And, and the question, this is, let, me, let me just address, the question is, is that going to continue? And, you know, and, and, I, and I, I like to focus on the exponent because, yeah, you can show all these numbers, and as the networks are getting bigger, if those exponents are not favorable, you put more work, Bill has to do more and more and more work, you know? <laughs> and, so, and so and so and so that's 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 question number one and the last point to address your point is some exotic scamion technology going to do it i don't think so your hardware reuse that you're talking about that your your networks are too big to fit in a in a in memory it's not true because a one terabyte phone that you have now can store gpus i mean uh, gpt3s 175 billion weights with room to spare 
So you yeah, can already exactly. fit it in a 3D memory chip. So the question is, 3D technology is going to deliver that number of synapses that you need. And the question is, how do you compute in 3D? Exactly. You want to exploit that. Exactly. You don't need any of, of the actual. Of okay, the biology. Pardon me? Take advantage of the biology, Fabiana. That's my, that's my point, right? Take advantage of multi layers that are already built for computation that you can tap into and. and yeah, you're just to put it in. part of the computation. To put it into perspective, the cortex is stacking synapses 2,000 layers deep. Because yeah. the synapse occupies two by two by two microns and it's two millimeters thick cortex. Right. So, 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 yeah, you need that. <laughs> okay, anyway, um, yeah, let me give it back to Regina. <laughs> yes. Can't hear you. We can't hear you. you, Regina. We can't hear you, Regina. You're muted, Regina. It's still muted. Yeah, it's still muted. Yeah, there's something, it's being controlled by a higher power. Yeah. <laughs> I have to, sorry, I have to, I have to interrupt you because there are also some questions from the audience. Okay. So uh, there's a question from Steve Ferber. Brains also learn from structural plasticity. Connections come and go over time. How important is this in sparse processing systems? So who would like to answer the question? Yeah, I think that is absolutely important. If now your representation, the basic unit of information is a sequence of spikes, and you want to actually make a segment of dendrite sensitive to a particular permutation of those spikes, that particular order, you know, that's a combinatorially huge space, right? And so you can't instantiate all those possible permutations. You have to actually rewire the system, you know, or use some kind of, in a chip, use some kind of circuit switching like in an FPGA. And and so you have a spare set of connections, but you can you can you can re re uh, reroute them. But yeah, so I think that's absolutely it goes with the data presentation. It's not going to be matrix vector accumulate like, and multiply like Ralph said. Right. It's going to be this combinatorial code searching this combinatorial space, looking for the right permutations, and that is a whole different kind of plasticity. And I also attention. attention. Go ahead, Ralph. One quick other thought: attention is really key, right? Putting the bits where it matters. I think, I think one of you said, I think maybe Jan said that, right, as well. So basically, you know, putting a front layer that, that tunes out, that, that, that uh, does some kind of a triage, that throws out stuff that are, you know, redundant and really relevant, and only keeps information that's, that's, that's needed, that, and, and in a smart way, right? In a way that is relevant to the task at hand. That's gonna be a key aspect of making sure that we can reduce power and, and reduce, uh, uh, yeah. I think Ralph, Ralph said pretty much what I was going to say. The way conventional neural networks do this is with an attention mechanism. The attention mechanism today is actually a matrix multiply, but there are more efficient ways of doing an attention mechanism, which Absolutely. basically puts the inputs that you want, you know, into the into the neurons that need them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So Thank the you. next question comes from Nicolas Martin. Uh, why human brain is so energy? particularly efficient. Would it be possible to save energy in neuromorphic systems using only the useful neurons? So who would like to answer this question? The, the main reason why the human brain is very efficient is because it's slow. If if you were to sort of take a, a you know comparable number of of neurons of a conventional neural network and look at the energy used to do the same kind of computation, you'd you'd be at about the same point. In fact, you may even be a little more efficient today. But you're 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 running way faster than real time for humans, right? Humans are going to process, you know, you know, video at at you know 10 frames per second or something like that. Look at the typical flicker fusion frequencies, and not you know millions of images per second. Um, so I think I what would, we need I to figure say, out is how to slow things down. I would say, Bill, you're stuck in the cloud. You know, if I'm on the edge in my phone, I don't need to be fast. Slow is good enough for me. And if that's going to allow me to detach from the cloud, I'm very happy with that. <laughs> yeah, but that's 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 kind of why I said that you know the, our technology is both too fast and too large, right? If we had, uh, if we could slow it down somehow, and at the same time make it much more compact, um, like you know the 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 density of uh, how neurons and and dendrites are 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 packed in the brain is 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 ridiculous. In fact, humans, what makes humans different from a lot of other species is that the density of neurons is much higher uh, in yeah. in. In, in primates than it, than it is in, I don't know, dolphins or whatever, or just about anything else. And so, uh, for example, and, and then the dense uh, packing, you know, you have 
you know, V1, the primary visual cortex area, has a whole bunch of neurons. You know, the, it takes input from the from the retina, and then it sends a lot of uh, uh, signals to V2. But you know, it's not like V1 and V2 are sort of two areas on your cortex. There is actually a fold, and and, and yeah. V1 and V2 face each other, and there's like a huge number of fibers between them. So there's a very very short connection between those two things, and they're very close to each other because of that fold. And in fact, mm -hmm. all the folds in the in the brain basically are things like that. You know, um, you're connected. They arise like that. Yeah. yeah. But that's that's my point. I mean, going back to you know to organoid intelligence, if you will, right? We need to take advantage of that. That that to me is the exotic future, right? That to me is where we can really take advantage of some of these um, you know uh, interconnections and do away with you know sorry Bill with 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 a you know with a GPU scenario, you know, and get into some real you know organic but intelligence. The advantage of being fast is that then you can multiplex. And build small, but multi low power multiplex things. requires you to go back and forth to memory, right? That's where you're bending but apart. You don't have to move it very far because it's already right there, right? Mm -hmm. And memory itself is not expensive. What is expensive is communication. I agree with you 100% on that. So don't move, don't move it back and forth. Right. <laughs> okay. Then the next question from Edgar Lemaire. Question to all: What do you think? of event-based sensors. In this context, event-based sensor produce a very sparse representation of spatial uh, temporal information, which could benefit to very low power processing and spiking accelerators without any conversion. Uh, so no translation costs. So this, this question is a little bit in line with what we <laughs> discussed about sparsity, right? So who would like to so that, let me answer that, please. If, and then, I, but I'm going to throw it to Jan because Jan said something that I disagreed with in his in his statement. <laughs> right? So Jan and I, a long time ago, worked in a project called NeoVision, and NeoVision basically was when uh, Clément Farber, you know, you and um, and uh, Eugenio and so on, we were working on these on these uh, image detectors and trackers, where we were essentially using a front end, which was a an uh, uh, event based camera. And then connecting it to the neural flow stack in order to you know to find objects and follow them and so on. In that project, we beat any other thing that was out there. In fact, our you know our efficiency and our you know ability to do recognition accuracy and efficiency out you know outperform any other uh, group that was in that project. And so when you said that we didn't, when you said that the the other ones you know, the is the non-event-based one won? I, I was a little bit confused about that, and that's what I wanted to get your your perspective. What did you mean? Um, <clears throat> the work I was studying was this paper that uh, Clément and a few people in my group and the genius group and uh, Bernard Bailey and Barranco wrote, where we just did did an A/B comparison, right? Um, and there was you know clearly uh, a pretty large factor in favor of uh, kind of more traditional digital. Uh, digital design compared to AER. Now you can always do it wrong, so you know. <laughs> okay. Um, it was wrong. No, okay. <laughs> uh, or you can always read better, I should say. Okay. And uh, um, and and you know, it's possible that the devil is in the details, but uh, but I can I can abide Bill's argument there. So that's um, you know that that there is some sort of inherent. Uh, uh, inefficiency. You basically have to wait a while before things settle when you have sort of event-based uh, systems. So what what happened to answer the question of that that was asked is that uh, there is you know quite a few people working on uh, sort of you know close to sensor event-based representations. Um, and there is some argument that you know it's uh, it's more efficient for certain applications, and that's become sort of the the refugee camp of the, the more morphic. Um, community a little bit of people who, uh, you know, really believed in that message, you know, and I was one of them, you know, early on in the 80s, certainly, you know, from, you know, Carver Mead's uh, uh, argument for it and everything. Um, and, and you know, progressively kind of interest in this has waned a little bit. And, you know, there's a few kind of defender of the crown, like Ralph and Kubina in the US. Uh, most other people have either moved to Europe or, or stayed in Europe. <laughs> Because, because you know you can get funding for this kind of stuff there, um, and, and there's been you know some uh, some effort uh, you know probably because the funding mechanisms are not as kind of monocultural as as they are in the U.S. perhaps. <laughs> and you know I th I think it's great. I mean I you know it's good for you know some people to work on this and sort of try to push the 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 boundary. And and again it might 
come to something at some point, just you know, not in the next five, ten years, and uh, and and perhaps it will require you know sort of major uh, changes in in, uh, in uh, you know fabrication technology, you know, like spintronics or whatever it is, uh, for for this to happen and become become practical. Um, Let me put a more you know, positive spin on it. Um, I, I think actually that that uh, Ben Pei sensors are are actually you know in use today and and very successful at a coarser granularity. And I think the whole question is, what is the right granularity? So today we have smart cameras that are watching all the time, you know, with a conventional camera chip feeding out your frames of video, you know, a neural network sitting there watching. And only when the neural network has a detection does it bother to do the expensive thing, which is kick on the next level neural network to say, what is that? And mm -hmm. communicate back to home base asking for help. And so I think today at that level of granularity, event-based things are, are correct. And the question is, how far toward the photo cell do we want to push that eventness and 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 right now it's not very successful to push it all the way you know to a given pixel activating when it sees something but it is very successful to scan out a conventional image and and have local neural network processing which is very low power before we do communication so uh, uh, finally yeah, i would like to move to 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 another topic raised by the audience by by julia uh Skaya. How does the field of AI today plan to tackle the problems of ever-growing networks, energy footprint of training, rigidity of the results, problems of domains where data is scarce, etc.? Do we have a plan or are we happy with today's success on the academic benchmarks? We have a plan. No. Well, I think we are happy <laughs> yeah, We aren't happy today. Um, because you know we you know we do see that it takes a lot of you know CO2 in the atmosphere to train networks. Although you know most people are working very hard or already carbon neutral in the way they do it, and, and I think that what we're doing is we're trying to constantly strive to be more efficient, both in the hardware we run these models on and in the models themselves and the data representations. Um, and there was a separate part of that question about data that I wasn't sure I got. That's okay, so and then I have another. It had to do with scarce data so so this is actually probably one of the hottest topics in uh, sort of ai deep learning today which is uh, how you train uh, very large neural nets which are capable of doing very complex things when you have a small amount of uh, human annotated data and the answer to this has been self supervised learning so all the large language models that we that have been mentioned uh, are trained essentially with self supervised learning which means that you're not training them for a particular task you're training them to represent the input and the way you do this is uh, you're training them to either complete uh, an incomplete input or to predict the missing part of the input. Uh, this has worked uh, so well in natural language processing that it's become completely standard. Uh, and that's what allowed the, the, the growth of those uh, networks and, and, and the kind of stuff they're doing now. Um, I mean, it's enabled uh, revolutionary things like, you know, you can do multilingual uh, speech recognition, multilingual translation from, you know, a couple hundred languages to another couple hundred with a single neural net. Uh, without having any parallel data between some of the pairs of languages, right? So that's kind of amazing. Um, and, uh, and, and you know, multilingual, you know, hate speech detection on, on Facebook, for example, things like that, which just, you know, wasn't working nearly as well just, you know, a year or two, uh, a year or two ago. So there's been huge progress there. That progress has not yet translated into similar progress in uh, image recognition, although progress has been really, really fast in that uh, respect as well. But in the context of image recognition, it's not been a revolution like in the context of natural language processing for reasons that I don't want to get into because it would be too long. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's clear that self-supervised learning is going to also revolutionize like all aspects of, uh, of machine learning. Uh, again, for the, uh, the one thing to remember about the uh, power consumption and carbon footprint, there is an enormous uh, uh, motivator, if you want, an, an enormous incentive uh, to uh, minimize the energy consumed uh, per operation for running neural nets, because certainly for operators like uh, like Meta uh, uh, and for the suppliers like uh, uh, like 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 Nvidia or or, or others, uh, there's an enormous incentive, uh, which is why there are enormous engineering uh, resources put into reducing the amount of energy and power consumed yeah. by those things. 
So yeah. we don't need Thanks to force people Sorry, to do it. I... Just do it naturally, okay? Sorry, I really so... I have to interrupt you. The, the time is nearly over. So we, I thank you all. I mean, this was a it was a very exciting discussion. But I have to finish this because we have to have the second poll and ask the audience who was now uh, convinced. Uh, I would like to thank all of you and the audience for, for, for the great discussion and the great questions. But we will move on out to the, to the final poll. Thank you, guys. That was really cool. <laughs> thank you. That was fun. Regina, thank you for moderating. Yes, thank you. Yeah, Thanks, and, and, and that was great. Thanks, everybody, for sharing your views so eloquently. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we convinced Jan. I think Jan is on our side now for me now. Yeah, I think uh, Bill is is uh, the last man standing here. <laughs> well, I'm 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 waiting for the next revolution. You know, maybe you guys will. Yeah, will I think it comes yeah. out. People people are looking at different time scales. I think is is it depends. That that's mainly what determines where you sit. That's true. Mm -hmm. I think it's a question of, of future. I think that's really fundamental. What we're talking about, you know, future. I, I think uh, what um, you know, what Nvidia does and so on is more now. And I think future is some of the more interesting structures that Paul talked about and I talked about. But that's yeah, my perspective. I think the we have now uh, the results of the Yay! poll. Yeah, so, so you, the, the considerable amount of, I mean, the no's were constant, but the yes uh, could convince a considerable amount of undecided uh, uh, audience. So, yeah, great, very, very interesting. So, uh, yeah, I would like to, uh, I have to apologize uh, to the audience because there have been many questions, but I was unable to to transfer the questions uh, to to the to the uh, to the panelists. Uh, nevertheless, I hope that everybody enjoyed this and uh, had a great time. Uh, so I wish everybody uh, good luck uh, for the research in the future, and let's hope that uh, AI will uh, improve and, and and make this step we are all waiting for in the future. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Bye. Wonderful seeing you again. Great to see you guys. Yeah, thanks everybody. Great to see you. Take care.